Today, somewhere on Earth is going to drop anchor in Jamaica, the third largest island of the Antilles, a land of majestic, tormented landscapes. In the north, there's more than 200 kilometers of coast open to the Caribbean rollers and the trade winds. The Jamaican mountains harbor an unspoiled world steeped in the strains of reggae music. Adam is a real powerhouse. He draws his energy from the most remote corners of the island. A veteran caver and tireless hiker, Adam likes nothing more than exploring the surprising treasures of his island. Howard the River Rasta lives in the Blue Mountains. Fisherman, farmer, and singer, he invites us into his world, a realm of dusky forests and bright mornings. Nakle came to Jamaica about 10 years ago. Born in Lebanon in the Middle East, he couldn't imagine his life without the sea nearby. From his war-torn homeland, he brought to Jamaica his passion for freediving. Being in the water, it reflect to me a little bit Mother Nature. Just being in this liquid that holds you, like, like, like a mother will hold, hold you and have the, her arms around you. So uh, it's, it's, it's an experience that, uh, that to me, um, I cannot live without. Jamaica is one of the largest islands of the Caribbean. Christopher Columbus landed on these idyllic shores in 1492. He discovered a wonderful island inhabited by natives, the Tainos. Jamaica, in the middle of the Caribbean Sea, was an ideal port of call for European navigators. This is a land of impenetrable valleys and mountains that reach to the sky. In the Taino language, Jamaica means land of wood and water. The island, furrowed by countless streams and rivers, is hidden by a dense, humid layer of vegetation. Far from the beaches swarming with tourists, we discover another Jamaica, mysterious and unexpected. Sometimes man and nature are perfectly in tune. Adam got up in the middle of the night. He has a five-hour hike ahead of him and is aiming to reach the roof of Jamaica before dawn. Adam's in luck this morning. He's been doing this ascent to the island's summit at over 2,200 meters for more than 20 years. Adam can feast his eyes on the most breathtaking spectacle Jamaica has to offer. It's magical, especially when you come up at night and you don't see the forest. You know, you're just, you're just focusing on the trail. And then when the sun comes up as it, as it is now and the forest comes alive, it's, it's a special place, it's a special place. As Jamaica awakens, it's a call to adventure. Adam, alone on his mountaintop, can savor the light and sounds that drift up from the forest.
up here. You know, you feel that you can do anything. You can accomplish all. You know, when your head clears and uh, you start to make sense of why you're here, you know, your, your purpose here. I'm a son of the soil, you know. <clears throat> it gets into your spirit. You know, whether you're, you're up here in the mountains or underground in a cave or, or at the beach, I mean, the, the, the spirituality is, I think, all around. You just need to listen, you know, and you, you'll pick it up. Yes. It was in these mysterious landscapes, where sky, sea, and mountain confront each other, that the myth of the Pirates of the Caribbean was born. In the 16th century, seafarers from the Old World landed on this tropical paradise that sometimes lapsed into a hell on Earth. The coastline and waters off Jamaica are the theater of murderous boardings and bloody battles. Piracy rules the region. Hundreds of Spanish, English, French, and Dutch ships sail the warm waters of the Caribbean, their holds bursting with precious cargo and treasure. Pirates, freebooters, and buccaneers set up their headquarters in Jamaica. The island becomes a hotbed of piracy. The new world colonies of Spain are nearby, and Jamaica is on the route of the warships and trading ships that sail these seas. Pirates like Blackbeard and the bloodthirsty Captain Morgan, the most famous of them all, were the masters of Jamaica. Morgan became a privateer, then was appointed governor. The island would make him a very rich man. Jamaica in the heart of the Caribbean was an ideal base a pirate's lair operating under the skull and crossbones. Adam was born of a Canadian mother and Jamaican father, an artist inspired by the natural force and riches of the island. Adam has strong memories of his childhood where nature played such an important role. This nature that has shaped Jamaican culture into an authentic way of life and thinking. Our culture is very, very vibrant, very expressive. Um, you know, the people like to live as one with, with nature. So it's a, it's a very special place, it's a very magical place, you know, the, the, the energy here, not only in the environment, but in the people, very strong, very powerful. And that makes us Jamaicans. Adam is going to meet up with his friend Wayne in the thick of this dense vegetation.
Wayne is taking part in a study organized by American scientists on the king of the forest, the Jamaican yellow boa, an endemic species. Many times I've dreamt about it at night as a little boy, wanting to explore the forest like the early adventurers. A number of boas were fitted with miniature radio transmitters, and Wayne has to localize them in order to study their movements, their habitat, and their hunting grounds. When it comes to homing in on the invisible king of the forest, no one is better than Wayne. If I turn it this way, I don't get any signal at all. In this direction, I get a signal, but it's pretty weak. So the snake is not down there. It must be higher up. It's pretty close. It could be anywhere over here. Yeah, it could be, yeah, anywhere. It could be anywhere. Hey! You see him? I see, see him. him. He's stretching out. See him stretching out He's moving now. now. I can see him breathing. Yeah, you see him over there? You can see the little eyes. This is it, I've thought it could. Yeah. So how many times have you found her? I found her well, several found times, her but it's about been about two months, months now since, since I've seen any boas see at all. With all this data collected, they'll learn more about the territoriality of the Jamaican yellow boa, and so be able to protect it. This boa doesn't need a vast amount of space to hunt, feed and reproduce, but still, we have to grant this endangered species the place it deserves in the forest. Adam is going to plunge even deeper into the heart of his island beyond the last roads and villages. Cockpit country is a world apart, secret, nearly inaccessible. There are thousands of caves here, most of them yet to be explored. Here, we're just on the periphery of the cockpit country, entering it now. I mean, if you look, you can see the conical hill starting, the big limestone masses, this is the beginning of it, of the, the, the primary forest. Cockpit country is a wilderness. It looks like a myriad of giant tortoise shells. As far as the eye can see, thousands of limestone hills worn smooth by time. This is Jamaica's last virgin territory. Millions of years of erosion have carved out this unique landscape populated by rare plant and animal species living side by side. Cockpit country has another name in the form of a Creole saying, me no sen you no come, a clear warning that strangers are not welcome. This is the entrance to Potuhol. This cave has a special place in Adam's heart. Adam discovered this shaft with a friend one morning in 1994. The two cavers began exploring this previously unknown cave, a special moment in a man's life. 
Potuhol had a surprise in store for them, and Adam will never forget that day. Even today, he's one of the rare cavers to visit Potuhol. Its entrance is 30 meters below ground. scary and it's a hard sport but it's it's so rewarding you, you feel you're, you're at one with the earth you know it, it's a, a bonding takes place when my friend and I came back here to explore the cave we felt yes we are the first you know only to discover these magnificent drawings that have been here thousands of years before us. So we were not the first. And it was a very humbling feeling. We felt small, but, but at peace and, and, and in awe, you know? Um, a little scary too, <laughs> you know? Um, but it was a very emotional experience. My passion really started from reading books and, and, and seeing these wonderful pictures of, of caves around the world. Yeah, I must have been about 10. I read a little National Geographic magazine of a little boy in France who slid down a hole with the candles and discovered these beautiful carvings and, and, and pictures of bison and animals from back in the Ice Age. That story inspired me so much. I wanted to find my own. And ever since then, I've been um, exploring caves. Thanks to Potuhol, Adam's dream has come true. This is his underground lair, where he's directly connected with his own history. And this is what he discovered that first time. These drawings were done by the Taino Indians, the first inhabitants of Jamaica, thousands of years ago. When Columbus came here, he found them here. They were here living on the island. You couldn't help but think what life must have been like then, you know? What, what brought them down here to, what, what religious um, meaning do these drawings have? So it is, it is still open for interpretation, but I believe it's a religious site. I love the nature in Jamaica. It has so much to offer. You know, it's, it's pristine. It's beautiful. You really get to feel at peace when you're out in the, in the environment with nature. It's a very special place. I've been to other countries and other islands and I always want to come back home. And not just because I'm Jamaican, but the diverseness of the place. You can be 2,000 meters up and then at sea level in a matter of an hour. So the sun, the sand, the sea, and the mountains and the rivers, everything is packed together in one little island.
In the Blue Mountains, the streams and torrents have only a few kilometers to go to reach the sea. This is where Swift River takes its source. Water and forest marry to open a path into a peaceful realm where time alone passes. Howard is the Swift River Rastaman. Here in this valley that looks like a sort of fantasy Eden is where he was born 40 years ago. The Rastafari culture carries the weight of slavery and the memory of the men and women torn from their African homeland. For we is African glory. Emperor Ile Ile King Selassie I grew why? No need them to lie them Babylon story. Yes, Rastafari, and see we are no no way. In the 1930s, Jamaican blacks turned their hopes to Africa. Haile Selassie had just been crowned emperor. King of kings, Selassie claimed to be the direct descendant of the biblical kings Solomon and David. For the Rastafarians, he was a living god. Rastafari no got nothing to lose. No way. Rastafarianism is rooted in these valleys shrouded in clouds that are dispersed by the winds every night. Howard has been living in these mountains for 40 years. He lived for a while in Kingston, the capital, but he remembers that as a time of frustration. In the city, bullets fly, making shadows in the sky. Why keep walking the dusty streets when the forest can give you what you need? Living on the banks of the river, Howard has salvaged a part of his childhood happiness. Well, my first memory at the river is right here, where I'm sitting now. My mom sent me to full the water, and I see the raft, and I go on the raft, and I pitch off and wet up my clothes. So we go home, you know? And they say, what's your drop? So oh, we wet up rafting. <laughs> yes, sir, that's my youthful days, I remember, at the riverside, until now. Like when the river came down, it's like you hear a stream, like somebody playing music. You hear the stone go boom, boom, boom. Lots of kids afraid of it, but we don't afraid of it because we know what it's all about, because the river come heavy. And when the river come heavy, no one can cross over it. Neither the bird want to fly over it so easy because she is very terrible. Jamaica is a central place of the earth. Because we're surrounded by water. And this is like a ship. Jamaica is just like a ship to me because it, it, it's just a small island still, but it's very solid, you know? So I know, say, it's a blessed place.
I was born in the hills. I'm just a part of nature. That's why I was born in the hills. If I was not a part of nature, I would be born in the hospital or somewhere, you understand? So I have to burn where the nature is. So I love nature. So I communicate with nature, and nature communicates with me. Sometimes I sit down and I say, oh, I need something from the bush. I go and dig a piece of yam, and cut a banana or a planting, yeah, and come and cook. And that's natural from nature. Howard, the Swift River Rastaman, has a very simple mystical relationship with the natural surroundings of his birthplace. In the Rastafari culture, the earth produces plants and food. It allows the tree of life to thrive and people to progress on a spiritual path. to catch fish, but there is no fish today. But I hope we catch some. The force of life and the spirits hover over Swift River. Howard respects the past and carries his destiny in his heart like an unshakable force. For three centuries, Jamaica prospered thanks to its sugarcane plantations, where tens of thousands of slaves toiled. The Blue Mountains, Howard's Mountains, were their refuge when the first slave revolts broke out. The slaves that escaped from the plantations were called maroons. They were perfectly at home in this steep, inhospitable terrain where white men dared not venture. The Maroons set up self-sufficient communities in the eastern part of Jamaica. They were fearsome, invisible warriors. The wars, which lasted over 150 years, would eventually free thousands of men and women from their shackles. At the end of the 18th century, there were 300,000 slaves in Jamaica. Almost nothing remains from that period. In the heart of the Blue Mountains, only the stories linger on. In the Swift River Valley, near Howard's place, there's a ruin lost in the forest. The villagers call it the slave's house. These people, they work so very hard to be what they want to be, you understand, and to survive. So they will do anything to create a house just to have their shelter and to get away from the certain trouble, because his trouble was all around, you understand? So they want to get away from certain trouble, so they bring themselves and hide themselves up here, you know? This evening, Howard is waiting for the darkness of an almost moonless night. Yeah, it's a good night for fishing because there is no rain and the sky are very blue, so beautiful. So, and the water is nice too, but it's a little bit chilly, but don't mind. From you go inside the water and you get warm and used to the water, you don't feel cold again.
Howard can pass entire nights wading up the streams that feed Swift River. He could name every corner of his valley. He's scouting for what nature has to offer. bamboo torch, he's on the lookout for the slightest movement in the water. He's looking for little glowing red dots, crayfish eyes. Howard never sells his catch. Like all Rastafarians, he takes only what he needs. Fishing means, above all, communion with the river. This is what gives meaning to his life. When you feel lonely and you want some company and there is no friends around, you can come to the river because you have lots of friends. Because you could hear the rolling of the river and the sound it's like a lots of friends talking, you understand? So if you go to the deeper part of the water, it's silent. But if you come to the where the stone is, it's like a lots of people. Because the water just rushing between the stones, you know, and making that beautiful sound. Free diving is not your ordinary sport. You have to dive and hold your breath for long moments. For Nakle, this is like playing a piece of music written in his soul. People always want what they don't have. They dream of exploring the ocean floor and breathing seawater instead of air. After a three minute dive at a depth of 30 meters, it's time to surface and come back to the world.
water is so important in our life that we can not live without. Whether it is to drink it or to enjoy it within the sea or the river. And uh, I work all around the island and when I get the chance to go in the water, I will. And sometimes I will come here just to be in the wild and listen to the river, just hearing and being in the water. It's just a relaxation for me personally. When Naklay gets the urge to reconnect with the earth, all he has to do is leave the beach and head up this river. Water is his element, and it flows everywhere here in Jamaica. I feel very safe underwater more than on the road or in bed. Underwater, I feel like the safest, although for certain people, it's something that is very dangerous. But to me, I feel very safe. That's why it's a need for me sometimes. It's a refuge. Like I will go, it's a refuge just to have your moment with nature and connect with it. At some point, all children wonder what's on the other side of the sea. Ever since the dawn of time, people have crisscrossed the ocean, searching for adventure and sometimes in hope of a better life. It was the chaos of war that brought Nakle to Jamaica about 10 years ago. He and his family had to flee their native land, Lebanon. He went to Europe first, then spent a few years in Canada before dropping anchor in Jamaica. The forests, the rivers, the people, the sea, he was captivated by it all. The Caribbean has given meaning to his life. Jamaica has given him a peaceful new life with the local fisherman and his musician friends. We're struggling to survive. Well, where my family means the world. So we fight to stay alive now. First you rock me to sleep. From I'm very young, I was brought in uh, really in the sea. And my father used to take us to the sea and uh, we have learned so much from it. Uh, that is part of our life uh, now. Um, it's a passion for me. I don't think I can live anywhere far from the sea. Uh, I have traveled a lot and it's a uh, part of my life, part of my passion, that, uh, uh, that is a need for me to go. For me, I have to concentrate into listening to what my body tells me. Everybody I go to the sea, it's an experience, a new experience. So I'm just looking forward to going in the water, but at the same time, I have to relax myself because it's a sport where you need to relax and you need to concentrate uh, on all, all, all your body because in the water, it's a different thing. It's very important that you have a connection with the water. 
you understand, you can feel the vibration of the water, listen to the wind, listen to the sea. Uh, it's, it's very important because to me it's a passion and the only way you feel comfortable in that environment is that you, you really relate to the water. When I dive, the whole experience starts from I set my mind into going to sea. And then when I'm in the water, it's a different world. Being in the water, it will reflect to me a little bit Mother Nature, just being in this water that is this liquid that actually holds holds you like 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 a mother will hold hold you and have the, her arms around you so uh, it's an experience that uh, that to me um, I cannot live without Sometimes I close my eyes. I am in sense of all, of everything that is happening around me. Just gliding through the water, diving down, looking at the, at the floor, at the sea floor, the fish, everything, it kind of talks to me in a way that I'm looking and I'm seeing like traffic and a lot of things going on where people don't really realize such a life. And, and this feeling, it's fulfilling for me and this is what I'm always in search. Free diving is an inner voyage. Holding his breath for long periods allows him to leave the worries of the world behind. Baudelaire speaks of the alliance between man and sea. Man, no one has sounded the depths of your being. O oh, sea, no person knows your most hidden riches. How strange the secrets you preserve so jealously. Diving is a rendezvous with solitude. Here the sky and sea stretch to infinity, which gives a different perspective of the world around us. They both attract people with a thirst for adventure and the absolute. For Nakle, the sea is a strict taskmaster who doesn't tolerate complacency. He knows that it's not easy to come to terms with it. Nakle is a child of Lebanon uprooted by war. In Jamaica, he has made a new life for himself through his encounters with nature. The sea still nourishes him as on the day he was born. He draws his life-sustaining force from it. Jamaican fishermen are among the Caribbean's poorest. Not far from Kingston, there are even fishermen who take to the sea without a boat.
Bart is two miles out at sea. He's been letting himself drift since daybreak. Nakle often meets him when he's out diving. Hey, Nakle, how are you doing? How are you doing, buddy? Not too bad. So what are you doing now? I caught two fish. Catching two fish. <laughs> so you're using your fins to balance yourself? Yeah, in, in, yes, it's my engine. engine. That's, the, <laughs> that's the engine. <laughs> Before going out, I check the weather report on the television. If it's good, I come out. If it's too bad, I don't come. I don't have a life jacket. A boat dropped me off. It'll be back this evening. There are two of us. We watch out for each other. If there's a problem, we help each other out. Nakle's passion for the sea has also given him a vocation. For five years now, he's been working for a humanitarian organization that finances the construction of fishing boats for the island's poorest fishermen. For him, it's a way of giving back to others what the sea has given to him. When you start to work with the fishermen, you actually start to uh, come close to them, to the family, to the community, and you start to integrate yourself and they start to look on you differently and listen to you and learn from you. And you learn from them a lot and the lifestyle that they have because the most important part that we're doing is actually improving their livelihood through fishing, sustainable fishing. It's very emotional to me because I love the sea and I love the people and we're trying to make the two of them work uh, in, a, in a way that two of them can survive for, and, and have a better future. Nakle with his organization has been working with 17 fishing villages. They have financed the construction of 78 boats, quite a little fleet. If you can see the yellow and blue boats, those are part of the project of Food for the Poor. Uh, we come here and give them training in, in sustainable fishing to improve their livelihood. And part of the project also, we installed a solar light, as you can see, this light. So they have solar system here. In the night, they have lights before they go to sea or when they're coming to sea uh, at night. Nakle and the Jamaican fishermen have a common mission Fishing with respect for the environment and humankind, a vital issue for all the island's inhabitants. Used to be was a place full of love and harmony. And I pray that it'll come back to town, I know. No more bullets fly, making shadows in the sky tonight. Today, Somewhere on Earth is off to discover the Hawaiian Islands in the heart of the North Pacific. An archipelago made up of eight islands and a string of atolls. No dazzling white sand or barrier reefs, but landscapes in constant flux, sculpted by the whims of the sea, storms, and volcanic eruptions. Hawaii is a living land, a dynamic force. Here, man is dwarfed by nature, whose unbridled force rules supreme. Scott has been living on Kauai for 12 years. He explores the rugged landscape from the Waimea Canyon to the Napali coast.
This is one of the cradles of the Hawaiian civilization, home to the island's earliest inhabitants. Oahu is known the world over for its impressive winds and waves. Yuko has found her niche in life here. She's a sailplane pilot, always on the lookout for the slightest breeze to satisfy her passion. Olivier, a French astronomer, spends a good part of his time on the summit of Big Island, the roof of the archipelago. At 4,207 meters, the peak of the dormant volcano Mauna Kea is a window onto the stars where Olivier probes the depths of the universe. It's a bit like the monasteries of the Middle Ages, because there's a search for knowledge, and we work alone. We're on a modern spiritual quest, the scientific quest. Kauai is five million years old and the oldest of the Hawaiian islands. Erosion has left its mark, sculpting its dizzying cliffs and plunging canyons. Kauai is the fourth largest island. 80% of its surface is completely virgin territory. They call it the Garden Island. Kauai has no large town. The inhabitants are ardent defenders of their rural way of life. They've even passed a law that no building be erected higher than the coconut trees. Even today, those who live here consider their island as a sacred gift from their ancestors. Scott, a New Yorker, doesn't have Hawaiian blood, but he's a firm believer in this heritage. It wasn't really part of his plans to settle on an island. He came here on vacation and never left. In 1999, he became a guide. He and his friend Don, a helicopter pilot, spend their time searching out abandoned trails used by the early inhabitants of the island some 1,500 years ago. Uh, Spire 5 is approaching uh, Hanalei Ridge for Lumahai Saddle for Waini. On the reverse, 2,000. That little false summit right there, it looks like it might be kind of difficult to traverse. Yeah, it would be really difficult. That trail has eroded away with many years. Nobody's never hiked it in a long time. Um, a lot of Hawaiians like me, I'm a quarter Hawaiian, my dad's half Hawaiian. Um, you get a, I get a feeling of a presence of my own ancestors that are still with me when I look at the paths. That I'm a lucky guy that lives on an island in the middle of nowhere. I'm just a really lucky guy, away from a lot of things a lot of challenges for us to fly around the island uh, but also you see a lot of things that nobody else gets to see out here no one So here we are at the end of the world, basically. It appears as if we've walked right up to the edge of the Earth and then drops off, and there it is, the Pacific Ocean. You've got uh, 2,800 miles to Japan and Asia from here, and not much in between. Islands to the northwest, called the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, um, mainly inhabited by monk seals and seabirds. Not much else, so we're the most isolated landmass in the world, just out here. And when we come out here on the edge of the Nepali coast, it's literally you're walking to the edge of the world. I don't feel isolated here. I feel at home here. It's part of 
part of our world and it's a very special place where we have a lot of clarity, um, a lot of vision. The Hawaiian people, they say that we're the, they call it the pico, which is the navel or the belly button of the world. And so everything that starts, it starts here and then it ripples out into the world. The ocean off Kauai often gives a magnificent spectacle. I love being up here on the top. Uh, you know, here we are a thousand meters above the sea and it gives you this perspective where you can see the whales, you can see their shadows, you can see their water spouts, you can see their fins, uh, their pec fin slaps, or their tails come up. And if you're really lucky, you get to see a full breach where it comes up and then splashes out into the water. For countless Americans, Hawaii has always been a magical name that stirs the imagination. Jack London was one of those who initiated that legend. The globe-trotting writer, author of White Fang, was fascinated by these islands. In 1907, he left everything behind and set out with a crew on an epic voyage across the Pacific aboard his sailboat, the Snark. He left San Francisco in April, and it took nearly two months to reach the Hawaiian Islands. Upon arriving, he was awestruck. In his words, for 27 days, we had been on the deserted deep, and it was pretty hard to realize that there was so much life in the world. We were made dizzy by it. And Kauai is the embodiment of that dizziness. The Nepali coast is made up of five valleys protected by an imposing natural palisade. 1,500 years ago, these canyons, carved out of the rock by the wind and rain, were home to a thriving civilization unlike any other in the islands. Down here, all these valleys were populated by Hawaiian people uh, in the ancient days. Uh, that's why there are ancient trails going in and out of all of these valleys and along the coast. Each watershed or each valley was ruled by a particular chief of that valley. And it was divided into two parts. So the part by the ocean was for fishing and the part towards the, the upper part of the valley was for farming and they traded with each other. And you can still see a lot of old rock walls and archaeological ruins down there. The mist rolls in suddenly, covering the chasms and swallowing up the landmarks. For certain people, this is a sign that the gods are present. And when the fog comes in, it rolls in very quickly. And if you're out there on the poly or on the, in the, on the walls of the canyon, uh, you won't be able to see anything and get totally shut out. And that could be dangerous. Even today, Kauai is known throughout the Pacific for its vegetation. Some of its species are found nowhere else on Earth. When the early settlers landed here, they discovered a fertile, generous land. This natural luxuriance is a continuing marvel. The 18th century was the golden age of exploration. Expeditions followed one after another. There was Bougainville, the Frenchman, James Cook, the Englishman, who made the first European contact with the islands when he landed in Hawaii in 1778. Ancient people, ancient Hawaiian people lived down here, the Kua Aina, um, primarily because of the resources that were available in the area. There are springs down there to give fresh water, and the river water uh, was very easy to divert to create loi, which is what they use for farming. It's an irrigation system for uh, farming kalo or taro. 
Um, so they live back here. Also, it provided protection because uh, if you're deep in a canyon and you have lookouts, uh, you know, there's natural barriers and boundaries. So anybody who was coming in would have to come from only one direction and it would be very easy to defend. This island of Kauai had uh, five times the population that it does now in ancient times. And that means that when we go off the trail from what is now used, we're often find, uh, we're following in the ancient footsteps of our ancestors, the Hawaiian ancestors, and we're finding many hidden secrets there. The cliffs, the mist, and the vegetation deepen the mystery of the Napali coast. Totally inaccessible in certain spots, the five valleys jealously guard their secrets. Unraveling them means taking the pulse of the island. To be out here, it feels alive, and I feel just blessed to be here because not only am I in an incredibly beautiful place, I'm in an incredibly beautiful place that hasn't really been affected by mankind very much. Um, so it's truly nature out here. It's easy to see how Kauai can cast a spell on travelers. The Hawaiians call this enchantment the mana. It's the breath of the spirits, their life force. And this is what Scott believes he has found here. On Oahu, the third largest Hawaiian island, the essential is invisible to the eye. This land, like all the others, is subject to a huge current of air. All the islands are swept by this wind, tirelessly regenerated by the ocean. from the vast Pacific buffet the landscape, reshaping the contours of each island. There's no barrier reef here, so the swell is free to grow into impressive rollers that then break against the shore. People come from all over the world to challenge these breakers. In certain seasons, they can reach several meters in height. On Oahu, the waves are land onto their own. Fifteen years ago, Yuko left everything behind to come live on Oahu. Situated in the heart of the archipelago, Oahu is famous for Honolulu, the capital of the Hawaiian Islands. Yuko settled on the far north coast. Wind and waves, two elements indispensable to her life. We we'll splash also, and then also when they suck out to the, back to the ocean, such an energy is coming here. So my heart is beeping all the time once I saw it. And if I don't see just a beautiful calm day, it's all light, pretty, but the more water is bigger and bigger and a giant makes more excited because we cannot do anything. They are more powerful than we are.
I love surfing and flying because of very similarity for we have to know by the weather, what kind of weather we have and what kind of weather we have. Same as the water and sky is the same things because we have to read the wind, uh, current, and then everything is always have to think and I cannot stop thinking, always keep learning to think, to have a good time. The earth and the sky. Yuko has a deep craving for freedom. Here, far from her family, far from her native land, Japan, she has reinvented her life. Magic every day, especially the winter season. I see the well from the sky, and also winter time I can check the surf. I'm a surfer, and I'm looking for the wave all the time. And uh, definitely, I think you enjoy view from here. Sometimes we see Kauai, different island over there, and. Totally awesome view, spectacular. Flying and surfing is very similar, especially in the glider. And we have a great view all the time. But of course I have to look at land, make sure nobody at land. Yes, beautiful. Do we can be speed up and slow down and pick up and then like a surfing we call it the opposite lip. So this is like a surfing. Then I can go really steep turn. like surfing all the time. So it is similar. And I think that's why mainly I love flying the glider. And no much noise, just a wind noise, like a whisper. This is a beautiful toy for me. This is my baby, and also this is my friend and like a family. 
because without this, it's very difficult to enjoy my life. Moment to moment is a change in the wind. And uh, wind sometimes is strong, but the suddenly wind is die, and they're really different. And I really like that these changes, because changes is always I have to constantly uh, cautious and awake, always know what's going on. I love it. Yuko is self-taught. She has found fulfillment in her passion for the air that she discovered a few years ago here on Oahu, thanks to some chance encounters. Becoming a pilot and glider instructor has freed her of constraints. Living here means a lot for her. It's an accomplishment. This surfer of the winds always winds up a flight with a visit to the ocean. In Hawaii, all the islanders rise and go to bed with the sun. Every evening, the same ritual takes place. Life comes to a standstill. Every breath is suspended. The islanders pay homage to the grandeur of the Pacific. Yuko has brought a bit of the empire of the rising sun along with her. Hawaii is, makes me more opportunities come up open because multiculture, many Asian, and then many people already understand Japanese culture, so I don't have to explain my background. They already ready for accept me, so I can be open for myself to be open to be freedom. This is a really patient moment each time, and, and I love it. I love jujitsu, surfing, and of course flying. But the more important thing is that is happening in Hawaii. That makes me self really happiness, so complete. Weather is uh, always like this for the school in the end of the day or early morning. Yeah, this is a blessing. It's like liquid sunshine is what we call in Hawaii. It's a blessing. Hawaiians consider this a blessing when there's something of a special occurrence like this to be blessed with rain. Every day, Yuko takes fellow pilots up to surf the winds of Hawaii. She has made sharing part of the job.
As soon as the sailplane is released, Yuko sets out in search of waves, the passion of all the islanders. It's part of their way of life. Surfing was invented in Hawaii. The oldest known surfboards were found in the tombs of the chiefs. They're thought to date back to the 14th century. When the early explorers first saw surfers, they couldn't believe their eyes. There's even a legend that the islanders were so skilled with their boards that the Europeans thought they were walking on water. In the time of the ancestors, surfing was a social and religious ritual. By braving the ocean, the surfers could prove their worth and climb the ranks of society. They could even become king. This is what surfing means in Hawaii. Yuko, like the others, is waiting to seize her moment of grace. The fleeting instant when she becomes one with the Pacific. Especially from Asia, yes. It is uh, not easy to do what I do, because I move here for surfing, mainly. Then I try to think about what job I can do. I'm creative, I'm not working for somebody else. I'm always create my own job. I like more growing myself to be uh, independent. That's why I needed to live in Hawaii to make myself a very strong female and also strong creature to human being. So I can be uh, more kindness than just a strength, I mean, strong woman. I like to have both, so I need to learn that this kind of nature, this nature is always changing every day. I cannot control them. So same as other people, I cannot control other people. So this places, it makes me realize again and again, I cannot do control other people as a weather. Each island has its own world. On Oahu, life unfolds to the rhythm of the wind and waves. Thousand years ago, the ocean floor broke loose in an upheaval caused by the incredible turmoil in the bowels of the earth. A huge island surged up from the depths of the sea. It's Hawaii, and will give its name to an entire archipelago. Some call it Big Island. This new land is vast, and its volcanoes are enormous.
Big Island still evolves according to the whims of the lava flows. The craters are deep chasms that plunge into the depths of the Earth. Hidden far beneath the Pacific, the hotspot, as volcanologists call it, creates islands according to its whims. This deep geological phenomenon is the origin of the entire chain of islands. And this is not the end of the story, for in 10,000 or 100,000 years, the hotspot will once again give birth to a new island. Flying over this island is just spectacular because you can see the lava flows down below and they seem dynamic even though they're hundreds of years old. You really get a feeling for how the island was formed with layer upon layer upon layer of lava. So that gives the island a very dynamic feeling. The island's really alive. Olivier is an astronomer. He came here after his studies for on-the-job training and never left. He works in one of the island's most mysterious spots, Mauna Kea, a dormant volcano that rises 4,207 meters above sea level. In 1967, some 10 countries pooled their efforts to establish an observatory with the world's most powerful telescopes here on the summit. The extreme altitude and isolation make it a near-perfect site. You really have an impression of isolation. You truly feel far from everything. And in several different ways. In fact, you have the site which is lost up in the middle of the mountain. There's absolutely nothing around it. And when you look a little further out, you see the Pacific, and you realize that you're on an island, an island that's lost out in the middle of the ocean. So it's truly isolated in all respects. I love this island. I love the quality and pace of life. I love the people. I love the summit of Mauna Kea. It's hard to leave this place, really hard. I feel like the island is part of me, but even more, I feel like I'm part of this island. I really think I've put down roots here. Olivier, a PhD in astrophysics, has been here since 1997. He was born in Paris, worlds away from the North Pacific. For the past 12 years, he's been exploring all the roads of Big Island. This Frenchie has become a full-fledged Hawaiian biker. Mm. 
Hawaii doesn't at all fit your typical image of islands in the Pacific, largely on account of the huge volcanoes, you can see for yourself, and also because of the wide open spaces. It's not all about typical postcard cliches of white sandy beaches and palm trees. And what I really like is that even though we're on an island, traveling around here is like visiting other countries. You can visit Switzerland, Ireland, Sweden, wherever you want in 10 to 15 minutes. And that's fantastic. It's a two-hour ride up to the top of Mauna Kea. Not only is the mountain quite high, it's also very broad. Anytime he can, Olivier, a true enthusiast, does the trip on his motorcycle. Mauna Kea is a wild, hostile territory. Patches of snow here and there are a reminder that whatever the season, glacial storms can blow up at a moment's notice. At 4,200 meters, the air is thin and poor in oxygen. Just climbing a flight of stairs requires an effort. Okay, Greg, I made it uh, to the telescope, so... Uh... So, uh, I think we're ready for uh, dome rotation whenever you are. Okay. Is it possible to do just deck, or is that too hard in the sense that you have to compute uh, array and deck coordinates? No, that would be fine. Uh, you want me to go back north a bit? Yeah, that would be fantastic. You know, bring the telescope up to park to zenith or something like that. So telescope, uh, I have a somewhat emotional bond with this telescope because I did my thesis on an instrument here. So I came when I was a student. And it's a machine from another era, so you still have a real connection with the machine. Sometimes it's an emotional connection, because you spend entire nights observing and it's frustrating, but when it works, it's such a treat. So yes, this telescope has a very special place in my heart. Yep, it's coming down, coming down, and the dome is turning, so it's perfect. Okay, do you want the dome to move some more? Olivier's work days are so many sleepless nights. On Mauna Kea, the setting sun is the last respite before the silence of the night. Clouds conceal the other reality, the one down below. Little by little, the terrestrial world gives way to a world of stars and heavenly bodies. If the world's most powerful telescopes are installed here on the summit of Mauna Kea, it's because the sky is among the purest on Earth. There's less turbulence than elsewhere, and the pure air allows one to probe unexplored regions. Mauna Kea enters into a new dimension. This is a gateway to the depths of space, millions of light years away. Human time doesn't count anymore. Here, the astronomers can witness the birth of our universe. At 
At last, the steel cupolas are stirring. The astronomers in their bubbles become lone explorers, roaming from nebula to galaxy. Every observation begins with entering the coordinates, something like giving the address somewhere in the universe. So the coordinates are 23 hours, uh, 3 minutes and 15.6 seconds, and uh, deck is plus 8, 52, 25.2 in uh, 2000 equinox. So if you can point the telescope, I'm ready when you are. When you're on the summit of Mauna Kea, knowing that this is one of the world's best sites for astronomy, whether you're a student or a driven astronomer, there's really something magical. It's unique, very special. There's also a magical side concerning what you may observe. Sometimes it's an instrument that allows you to see the universe in a different way, a way we've never looked at it before, and then you feel the magic. Sometimes it's an observation, discovering a new asteroid or new supernova in a galaxy. You get that same magical feeling because you're in contact with a living universe where things are constantly changing. And that's magic as well. The strange atmosphere you experience on Mauna Kea, I think it's obviously due to the lack of oxygen. Your senses are affected, you're a little slower, a bit more sluggish, and also you perceive things differently. And it's also a bit strange because we're so isolated, there's nobody around. So it's a bit like the monasteries of the Middle Ages. And it really is, in fact, like a monastery because there's a search for knowledge and we work alone. We're on a modern spiritual quest, the scientific quest. Of course, we're tired after a long night of observing, but this is the reward. So we enjoy the view before going to bed and then sleep through the day before we get up to start another night.
Mauna Kea is the highest mountain in the world, measured from the base of the seabed. It's a mountain that's 13,000 meters from the base to the summit. Everest, with an altitude of 8,000 meters, is higher, but is already on a plateau, so its height is actually less. Mauna Kea is the tallest mountain on Earth. Treading these desolate expanses is also an encounter with the myths and legends of Big Island. The summit of Mauna Kea is a sacred place. Mona means mountain, Kea means white. Mona Kea is a sacred spot in Hawaiian tradition because it's where the gods of the heavens meet the gods of Earth, thus giving birth to humanity. So it's the center of the universe for Polynesians. It's a very sacred spot for them, for all of Polynesia. This shrine marks the highest point of Hawaii. Mauna Kea is so sacred that the Hawaiians celebrate their most secret rituals here. In the midst of this desert lie the tombs of the great Hawaiian chiefs. The mystery remains intact. As a mark of honor, their remains were placed here as near as possible to the gods. Those who tread this barren desert, swept by the winds and snowed under in winter, find themselves pervaded with an eerie impression, a voyage suspended between heaven and earth. Life seems to be thriving at the foot of the volcanoes. From north to south, east to west, each of the cardinal points has its own specific climate. Big Island is in a restless mood. Whenever he can, Olivier spends time transmitting his passion to his son, teaching him about the planets and stars. I'm often away doing my observations up on Mauna Kea, and the children aren't allowed up there on account of the lack of oxygen. So this is a way of showing him just what you can see through a telescope and letting him see the wonders of the sky for himself. This is how you, you control the telescope. <coughs> you can tell it what object this way. Okay? Now, maybe we can try. Oh, yeah, the sailboat? Yeah. yeah. You can try uh, lining it up on the sailboat. You remember Saturn? Yeah. It's the one with the rings, right? Yeah. Yeah, you remember that. that and Jupiter? I remember in the sky map. Yeah. Um, it showed Venus uh -huh. within the scorpion. That, that was for back then. Yeah, because that was in summer, right? According to an Hawaiian legend, the universe was formed from the marriage of darkness and light. In the warm glow of the sunset, the Pacific pays homage in its own way to the mystery of its origins.
Fiji, an archipelago located in the Pacific Ocean. Of its more than 300 islands, only about 100 are inhabited. In these parts, life rolls along to the lazy rhythm of the long ocean swell. There are three colors to the Fijis, the white of the long beaches, the turquoise blue of the lagoons, and the green of the jungle. And rugby is a religion here. Frank, a rugby coach, chose to combine the easy life of the islands with his passion for the oval ball. He combs the villages of the outlying islands, hoping to discover the rare gem of Fijian rugby. Hannah is a surfing champion. She and her friend Ise are in search of the perfect wave. Their quest will take them all the way to Cloudbreak, one of the most beautiful waves in the world. For Hannah, the ocean is her lifeblood. Manasa lives in Benga, an unspoiled atoll where the traditional rituals form the bedrock of the community. In the shelter of the barrier reef, just a stone's throw from the village, Manasa goes diving with his son Tumbi to feed their guardian angels, the shark gods. I live in a very little paradise, you know? I, I don't want to stay in uh, overseas, Australia, America, uh, maybe France or Europe. I like my little world. It looks like this. Uh, no big, no small. Uh, I leave this in my heart. The Fiji Islands, located in the heart of the Pacific Ocean, are isolated from the rest of the world. Situated 2,000 kilometers north of New Zealand and about 3,000 kilometers east of Australia, these volcanic islands are made up of mountains covered with tropical forest. It's a corner of the world where time has never mattered, perhaps because the weather is so clement all year round. Before Christianity, many people in Fiji believe that uh, they need a guardian. We're supposed to have a guardian. That is before Christianity. So uh, many people in Fiji, they choose different types of uh, uh, nature. Uh, they choose nature, like uh, a little mountain, uh, ocean, moon, sun. But the people from my village, they choose uh, sharks to be their sea god. So the story goes like that. Uh, we believe that that uh, the sharks in the oceans, uh, those are our guardian. As soon as we jump in the water, we don't have any fear because the same guardian is looking after us. Uh, you know, ocean, they rule the ocean, right? Sharks rules the ocean. They, they balance the ocean, okay? When we jump in the water to meet them, we respect them. Manasa Bulivu has been diving under the protection of his shark gods every day for the last 15 years. These turquoise waters were part of his childhood, and his first dive was a revelation. Ever since, he has been doing his best to preserve this underwater realm and protect the coral barrier reef.
Every weekend, Manasa takes his family to the island of Benga, where he was born, across from the main island. The ferry does a daily run and takes two hours to make the crossing. Everyone on the boat knows Manasa. They even call him Papa. He holds a very important position in his community. He is the village spokesman. Rukua is a little village like so many others in the Fijis. A few houses by the lagoon, coconut trees, no roads, no stores, and villagers enjoying the good life. That is my village. This is where I uh, was raised. This is uh, from my ancestor, my great-grandfather. And until today, I have a family, and this is my home. My son, my daughter, they all born in this village. I found my beautiful wife in this village, so uh, I don't have to go away. Uh, everything is right there, and the ocean behind me, that is our resources, and uh, we respect the animal in the ocean because we believe that uh, we are one. So it is like a, a freedom paradise. This is nobody want to live. We want to stay here forever. <laughs> yes. a little bit of a uh, heart problem. In 2007, I was in hospital, and uh, since then, my whole life changed. Um, it's changed completely. Yeah. I choose uh, the way to be a very honest Christian, uh, you know, to worship uh, the mighty God. And uh, I'm very proud to be a, a preacher and look after a church. The everlasting life is only given by the master himself. Hallelujah. By God himself. By the Lord Jesus himself. No one can give this life. It's only him himself. In the Fiji Islands, Sunday is a day devoted to prayer. Several families have come by boat from the island's other villages to attend Manasa's services. Afterwards, the parishioners stay to share a meal together. It's the traditional ways, like to share. Like Fiji, uh, the standard of living is low, so most of the thing, so most of the family that doesn't have like a source of income, so that's why we share. The more we give, the more we get. This morning, they're preparing for a traditional ceremony in the forest. The young men of this island have a special gift, walking barefoot over burning stones, the firewalk. Tunbi, Manasa's son, is going to participate for the first time. Long time waiting. I've been waiting for a long time. 26 years now. I moved to the mainland when I was small, just a small boy. And now today I'm here to do the fire walk. It's good. I'm very excited about this.
Tunbi must present himself before the sacred fire with a pure heart. And for that, there are a few rules to respect. He's been uh, very honest with a promise. No coconut for four night and no woman for four night. It's really tough for the young people. No, no woman for four nights is, yeah? I, I told the priest, I think two nights is okay. <laughs> but the priest said, oh, oh, four nights. The stones have been heating in the fire pit for five hours. The ceremony can begin. The men are totally concentrated. They're invoking the spirits and asking them for the ancestral power that only the village inhabitants possess. We walked on fire. Yeah, no pain. The stones felt cold. It's okay. <laughs> it's the power of the fire walk. We gather it here and we use it to walk over the stones. On the island of Benga, legends and the supernatural encroach on reality. Manasa is proud of his son who has braved the sacred fire and stones for the first time. Tunbi loves diving just as much as his father. Today, like every day, they're going to see their second family, the sharks. So I'm just about to get ready to introduce myself to the underwater world. Uh, most of the animals, they, they know me very well the last 15 years. So uh, still I have to use this. Uh, they know Papa very well.
I feel great because uh, when I put my wetsuit on, my fins, my mask, with a tank behind me to enter that world down there, it's something that's in my heart. I know because in the, in the underwater world, there is my guardian there. Uh, he looks after myself, my son. The life is very different down there because you see the fish, they don't know anything about, you know, the war, about what is going on up here. Uh, they're very friendly, so I want to put myself just like them. Since he had his heart attack, Manasa doesn't dive more than a few meters down. Tunbi has taken over from his father. He has a rendezvous in the depths with other sharks, the bulldogs. Manasa shares his life between these two worlds. On land, he's actively involved in the community of Rukua. He's one of the pillars of the village. In the depths, he's the privileged witness and guardian of an underwater realm. Manasa knows that these two worlds are inextricably linked and complementary. We want to keep this uh, bay and this uh, place as it is. As you can see, there is no building, no cars, no boat, <laughs> just us. And we want to keep the population of my village uh, as low as we are. Yeah? In another 10, 15 years time, I believe in my heart, this place here will be still the same. And then we will pass it over to our generation to come. When I will be old, my grandchildren, you go there and use the land. Anna Bennett and Issei Tukovu are two of the best surfers in the Fijis. They spend days on end in search of the best waves. It's good to, you know, envision yourself before you're out surfing and um, hopefully it'll be some fun waves. So, yeah, concentrate, but surfing is fun. You know, not too serious for fun. Yep. So there's my wax. 
Check my fins, make sure they're on tape. Hannah, who's 22 years old, is a surfing champion. She competes under the Fijian flag in international meets, and she recently won the Melanesian Cup, a meet open to the best surfers of this part of the Pacific Ocean. It takes one wave to fall in love with surfing, but it also takes one wave to just completely not want to do it again. But when you fall in love with it, it's so worth it. It's, you know, words can't really describe it. You forget about the paddling, how hard it is. You forget about, you know, almost drowning sometimes just for that feeling because it's very in the moment and um, it's very intimate with, with the ocean, with nature. Anna grew up in Rotuma, a remote group of islands in the northern Fijis. Her life goes from one side of the Pacific to the other, from California, where she's finishing up a degree in international trade, to Fiji, where she has her roots and comes to recharge her batteries. water planet. It's everything, you know, it's all around us, it's in us. Physically, you can't live without water, but also mentally, I don't think I could live without being surrounded by the ocean. As a person, I need water. <laughs> I need the ocean to mentally be healthy and stay sane in a way. I could never live in the desert or inland or in cities for years at a time. Wherever I go, you know, I'm it's always based off of where the ocean is going to be. To set sail on the high seas, an adventure that has always inspired humanity. Ever since the dawn of time, the most daring souls have challenged the horizon in search of new lands. Flip, right, go. It's generally thought that migration to the islands of the Pacific proceeded gradually starting in southern China. The men and women who would discover the largest ocean on Earth first made a sojourn for several generations in Taiwan. Their most intrepid descendants pressed onward to what is now the Philippines and Indonesia. Sailing from island to island, those adventurers explored the Pacific in the hope of conquering unknown lands. Those mariners opened new routes towards virgin territory. Once they had settled Vanuatu, they were within 800 kilometers of the Fiji Islands. The Fijian people have their distant roots in a group of exceptional seafarers. In 2011, a German philanthropist decided to revive that epic journey in his own way. He built several traditional sailing canoes to undertake a sea odyssey across the Pacific to California. Hannah followed the expedition very closely. She was even a crew member when this boat first took to sea off the coast of Fiji. Angelo, a skilled sailor, quite naturally became skipper of this mythical craft, the Uto Niyalo, 
heart of the spirit. Leon, select this one. Like the first, first, the first. There were seven canoes like this, all the same, different islands, like Samoa, Tahiti had one, New Zealand had two. So we sailed as a fleet, just raising awareness and trying to prove that what our ancestors did, we can still do it. You know, we proved that we don't need fuel to travel so far, and we, and we did it, you know. The voyage was 20 months in total. Days in sea, the longest we were out there was 31. No land, no TV, <laughs> nothing, yeah. Just looking at a lot of flying fish, and that's pretty much it. These latter-day seafarers accomplished the entire crossing without the help of any navigational instruments, just like their ancestors. No charts, no GPS, no sextant. The sailors on board were armed with no more than their daring, their keen intuition, and the stars to guide them across these vast expanses. That knowledge is being lost now. Only a handful of people, they know it. So one guy in Satawal, in Micronesia, he taught five people. His wish was for that five to teach more. So we were lucky we had three of the five on the voyage. Yeah, that was a big part of people's lives back then, you know, our ancestors, this is what they did. And to see it, you know, unfold and people try to practice it the same way is, is a beautiful thing. It's reviving our culture again and it's reminding the next generations of who we are. Every time Hana comes back to the Fijis to train, she connects with Ize. He's like a big brother, but he's also an exceptional surfer who knows these islands better than anyone else. get out to the open sea and the rollers, Hannah and Ize have to cross a vast mangrove swamp, a sort of natural passage from the world of land dwellers to the realm of the surfers. Cloud break is one of the most beautiful waves in the world. It's like an El Dorado for surfers. Every year, the world surfing elite comes here for a prestigious international meet. The jury officiates from a stand built right in the sea facing the legendary wave. For me, the perfect wave is a feeling. That's very hard, I think, when you're surfing. It's very in the moment and it goes by so fast sometimes you don't appreciate or you, you can only reflect on it after you've surfed the wave. But for me, the perfect wave is being able to actually recognize that feeling as you're surfing the wave. So a nice, long, you know, good sized wave that as you're surfing it, you just, you're aware of oh, how good the feeling is, you know? Yeah. Nice, Dave. Woo! It's very easy to shoot waves in Fiji. The waves are so nice here. The light is perfect. Water is blue. You don't have to be a very good photographer to take great photos here. It's really easy. Look at this place. It's beautiful all by itself. Surfers form their own oh. tight-knit community, and Stuart is a well-known figure at Cloudbreak. Beautiful. Come have a look at your shots. So many sick ones. Look at this shot, you're gonna freak out. This is like a magazine cover. Check this out. Wow. 
these waves have traveled for thousands of miles from from a storm here in, off Antarctica, all across the ocean, and you wait for them. And then you ride their energy, and you can feel the, the whole energy of the ocean go through your body, and it's, you forget every worry of the world. You can't pay for that. There's no drug, there's no therapy you can do that is, that is better than surfing. It's like being hugged by the entire ocean. It's a really great feeling. Surfers don't pit themselves against the ocean and the waves. They strive to become their accomplices and play with the elements in order to reach a state of pure pleasure. become one with the forces of nature, a challenge that one throws down only to oneself. You feel very vulnerable, but very powerful at the same time. Um, you know, I, Sometimes I'm the biggest scaredy cat out there. I'm terrified, but that's when I feel most alive. The ocean is, is like my second home. You know, we're brought up around the ocean and nature, and you just you learn to adapt a lot to your surroundings, and that's, that's a great skill to have. This is where I was born and raised, and I wouldn't have it any other way. This is my home base. I mean, everywhere I go, um, it's almost as if it makes me appreciate Fiji even more, and it makes it just as special. There were a lot of sailors in my family. My great uncles, my uncles. They sailed the South Pacific a lot, and they brought back a lot of souvenirs that would just stir our imagination. And in particular, when we were little, my brother and I had a book on Tahiti in Polynesia with a picture of an island girl on the beach, and she was bare-breasted. It was really quite alluring. <laughs> That's what set me to dreaming about the South Pacific ever since. It's a bit of a cliche, but it's the honest truth. Frank Boisvert is heading for Bukama, a village in the Yasawa Islands, isolated in the northwest of the Fijis. Frank has been an international rugby trainer for more than 40 years. Whenever he can, he goes from island to island, meeting the village rugby clubs. He's also out to spot the young talents that may someday play in the world's leading clubs. Fiji is a major rugby power in the Pacific. And in fact, if it weren't for its international reputation in this sport, the archipelago would be completely forgotten. Frank has been living in the Fijis for 17 years but this is the first time he's come to train the players of Bukama. Still, everyone knows him because he worked with the National Rugby Sevens team here. Uh, 
Uh, yeah. Fiji is uh, the furthest island uh, here. It's a sour, and that's the furthest village there, Sawirara. It's a new adventure each time, but more important, there's the notion of sharing. They really like to share their experience, their history. That's part of how they teach the sport here, because the rugby in Fiji really meshes quite well with their culture and traditions, and also with their history of warring between villages. Now they don't make war anymore, but the village over there comes every Saturday to play that village down there. So in a way, they're carrying on their warrior rituals of the past. Fijian rugby, the clan spirit is an essential element. Each match begins with the thimbi, a warrior dance designed to provoke and intimidate the adversary. Rugby is a combat sport, and in the Fijis, the warrior enjoys a privileged social status even more so than a school teacher or a doctor. If God invented rugby, he surely invented it for the Fijians, and in particular, sevens rugby, no doubt about it. And I think that's just what God did. He invented rugby for the Fijians, the Tongans, and the Samoans. Seriously, it's a blessing for these countries because it can channel all the energy of the youth and the warrior spirit that goes with it to defend their village to defend their island. It's essential, so we have to use that. The coach is waiting in the village. Something we don't know, we learn from him. And the first time, too, we see Frank. We just hear his name on the radio, see on the TV. First time to see him. Organic goalposts, respect for the environment. We use what we have at hand to construct the goalposts. This is genuine rugby, like we used to play as kids in the villages of southern France, in Catalonia and in Occitania. We used to do things like this, so for me, this is like going back to my roots. There are some 200 Fijians playing in different French rugby clubs, and the demand keeps rising for these rugby artists with their singular style, a mixture of power and improvisation. I've had the good fortune to discover players in their unpolished state. I often cite the example of two players I recruited right from their village. They were practically barefoot, with just a t-shirt, and they were fish farmers to help their parents support the family. And six to nine months later, there I am at the National Stadium in France, watching them play in the finals of the top 14 in front of 80,000 people. A thrilling moment. 
Sí, sí, Just fantastic. Being a rugby trainer in the Fijis means dealing with the oppressive heat and the slow rhythm that goes along with it. For the moment, there are only children in Bukama. No sign of any players yet. I think we're going to be running on Fiji time, meaning practice will begin around 3.30, 4 o'clock. Maybe. Time is a vague notion on the island, because no one has a watch. There is no time. So we'll just wait and see. A good coach should always arrive before his players. That's not very hard here. Hola, Charlie. Hola, hola. How are you? How was work? Good, good. Yeah, yeah. The teammates, they're gonna come soon? Ah, uh, yeah, soon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Take the coconuts and we're gonna go in that part of the field, eh? For now? All right? It's, uh, this part of the field is better. Okay, let's go. <laughs> oh, yeah. When you do the group game, then I blow whistle. Oh, then you go long passes. Ready, go! Get out of the way, guys. A time in such shoulder, good. Well done. Ready, go! They're not used to training. They're not used to having strict practice sessions, not used to organized drills. So you have to break them into the routine. But once you do, they take the ball and run with it. Straighten up! Good! Very good! All right! You just have to give them a few pointers, put a little order into their game. And once that's done, they know how to do the rest. Good. All right. Pass. 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 Put it down. Put it down. Run away. Rewind. 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 Yeah. All right. Go. On joue pour rigoler, pour they play for fun to relax, which is a strong point because I think you need a playful dynamic to do well in sports. You really have to have fun, enjoy it, and all the rest will flow naturally. The really nice thing about these islanders is that their basic motivation is the joy of playing. Good, place the ball. Go. Thanks to his reputation, Frank is respected by everyone here. Today, he's training future players, but Fijian trainers as well. He has also set up a prisoner rehabilitation program. Frank is teaching them the profession of referee. I think rugby is a social regulator. You'll notice that in countries where there's not as much rugby, the crime rate's extremely high, but not here in the Fijis. And I noticed the same thing in Tonga and Samoa. All the young people play rugby. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they get out of school, they get off work, they come in from the fields and they play rugby. And when the match is finished and they've gotten rid of all their aggressive hormones, they're worn out, with no energy left to go out and get themselves into trouble. All right. Crouch. Bind. Set. All right. Look at that. Beautiful. Nando sana Lucy, Nando sana Lucy.
There are no roads to speak of here, so people get around with the village's one motorized pirogue. In the Yasawa Islands, they even bus the children to school by boat. In Bukama's village school, there are three levels in each class, and the children learn English right from the first grade. English and rugby, both legacies of the British colonization. At recess, Frank organizes a rugby match. It's France versus Fiji. All right. Hey, you, so you score a try over there? Got it? And you guys score a try over there? Right? Yes. So you must pass a good ball to one girl? Yes. All right, and we must have three passes. The women of Fiji are struggling to free themselves from the weight of tradition, and Frank is convinced that sports are one of the best ways they have to achieve that goal. Promoting women's rugby has been a personal crusade of Frank for 30 years. He's convinced that playing rugby in school will bring about a change in people's attitudes. Come on, guys! Naka, eh? Yeah? That was fun, eh? Yeah. All right. You like rugby, eh? Yeah? yeah. That's very good, and you're going to be a very good player. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be a very good player. Yeah. All of you. Thank you. Okay. Women's rugby is really taking off now. And here in Fiji, we have the Fijianas. You're going to, you, maybe you can play for Fijiana, yeah. eh? Yeah. The national team who beat New Zealand back in October and were world champions in sevens rugby. So they have enormous potential which we'll have to nurture in order to take on the really big teams. OK, let's do have a cheer. Let's go. Frank continues his voyage on to the next island, on to the next rugby pitch. As a trainer, Frank has always sought to transmit his passion and love for this sport. It's very important to me that the Fijian trainers and coaches be competent so that they can carry on the work themselves and not depend on the know-how of us Westerners. As the saying goes, it's more important to teach a person to fish rather than fish for them. That has been the guiding philosophy in my work here. I always try to stand back a bit and help them to grow and develop. For Frank, rugby in the Fijis is a lovely romance between a game imported from the other side of the planet and a people born to play it. <laughs> 